Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Welcome to the first Sunday of Lent. It is Lent season. It's a time when we focus our attention on the journey that Jesus took to the cross, to the grave, to the resurrection, the basis and foundation of our faith. It is a great time of the year in the spiritual calendar as a Christian, and we look forward to celebrating those markers with you and celebrating all that the Lord has done for us. Let's stand this morning, if you're able, and let's sing, Call Upon the Lord.
Good morning. Whoa. So, everybody recovered? Got all your chocolates eaten from Wednesday? With your punchkis? Okay. Announcements this morning. If you brought an offering today, there are containers in the back uh, for, and envelopes to be used if you'd like to do that. And if you're giving online, that's available too through our website. You can make some links uh, for that. Um, please stay in touch with what's happening. Each Wednesday, Kim puts out an email telling you what's happening and everything. And special thing for uh, the Seder presentation in March, which is uh, like a Last Supper or Passover meal. And that's March 27th, Steve, at 6 p.m. for wanting to know about that. And then come April on your calendars, April 13th to be exact, uh, at 6 p.m. Up, upstairs, we'll have a trivia night as a fundraiser. So think about who you want to be on your team and try to go through the encyclopedia and in everything, and maybe you'll be the winner of trivia. Um, for prayer time, we want to lift up Martha Dubison and her family, which is Lisa Fullman's mom, and um, she's in the later stages of dementia and on hospice care. So that is a traumatic experience as we go through life and we know it comes for all of us, but that doesn't mean it's, it's a thing that we need to comfort each other with. Also, continue prayers for Nolan, Marshall, and Anna Bocock and their families with their medical and physical and emotional things. And a prayer for our leadership. We have a, a new board uh, we'll be starting as of tomorrow night, and their direction for their leadership through this coming year. Let's take, take time to pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the sunshine today, just to let us know that spring is around the corner, that the gloomy clouds of winter are receding, hopefully. We thank you for the blessings. We thank you for the comfort in our not so blessing day something but we know all things work for the good of your glory lord we just pray that we can become come together and be useful tools for your ministry we ask this in jesus name amen let's stand and sing take my life and let it be
right, take a moment, turn to your neighbor this morning and greet them in the Lord. today, something that spoke to you about the message the last few weeks, or something the Lord's doing in your life. Now's the opportunity for you to share if you'd like. Share with the church family. Rocky's got the microphone so we can hear you. Uh-oh. I hope it's nothing I did. <laughs> it isn't. He's sweet as always. I just want to say what a blessing that I now have a nine-year-old grandson And it's just, I look at him and he's such a blessing. And then my daughter who has one of those significant birthdays this coming Saturday, and what a blessing she is that God has gifted us with them. To family, family, family. Oh, Tracy. Um, as some of you probably read um, in the online emails, um, we got approved for the SED waiver for Nolan again for another year. 
So that means that his services can continue. Um, like I said before, our wraparound care coordinator is moving to a new position, and we didn't know who was going to take on our case. Um, she did tell us on Thursday that her supervisor told her she will be taking on her new caseload of 50 patients, but also retaining her former caseload. So we're not losing her, but I would like you to shift your prayers to helping her because she's going to be very overloaded. Um, and it's a blessing that we're not losing her, but I know that that's a significant amount of stress for her. So. What's your first name? Selena. Selena. So remember Selena in your prayers. I just want to thank the Lord for always being there for everyone's children. I know we pray over them even when they're in utero, right? Um, but I do want to say that um, our youngest son, uh, a week ago, was in an accident avoiding a deer and praised God. He saved and spared his life and his friend Ethan. So just always pray for all the kids that are in this congregation and for those who are about to uh, be born. You just never know. And um, his grace is sufficient. We give him all the honor and glory for all things. Amen. And we're all somebody's children, so we got to pray for everybody. <laughs> Anybody else? So, as we, Dean mentioned in the beginning that we're in the Lenten season, and uh, usually Lent always means, to, or for certain denominations, to give something up. But then I read an art article in a newspaper about instead of giving something up, how about giving something back? How about being nice to somebody that you normally wouldn't step out of your comfort zone raise your hand to the Lord maybe a little bit more and I'm guilty of this myself because I'm going like oh, I don't want to do that because it doesn't feel right you know but or I remember one time in a church back in Bay City a long time ago where we gave an extra five dollars each Sunday towards the offering and giving something so that's kind of like giving something up but it can help the ministry too so that's what I'm going to try to do. Give a little bit more. And who knows, if I don't miss it, I'll just keep going that for the rest of the year. We'll see what I can do with disposable income. I don't care how bad the economy is. We can do it. I can do it. Thank you. Let's stand one more time. Let's sing our new song, King of Heaven.
I'm glad you've not uh, run out of things to praise God for. Let me um, begin by mentioning something that I brought up at the end of last week's message. I had mentioned to you that scholars point out that all of God's attributes can fall into one uh, or two categories. They are either incommunicable or communicable attributes. Those that we have examined up to this point have all been incommunicable attributes. That means that these are attributes exclusive to God. He does not share them with us in any way, shape, or form. They are just his. They are divine. Communicable attributes, on the other hand, are those attributes of God that he allows humans to possess, although to a finite degree, such as love and mercy and so on. I also mentioned how I believe that these communicable attributes are a part of what it means to be created in the image of God. So the first communicable attribute that I want us to look at is the attribute of holiness. Now, I am sure that you are not surprised to know that God is holy, right? Of course he is. I'm not addressing this attribute first because it is the first or it's the greatest of God's communicable attributes. From the very beginning of this series, I mentioned to you that uh, there is no order, no particular order to God's attributes. This leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. What I did say that all of God's attributes are in balance. I mentioned to you that God never exercises one attribute at the expense of others. Hopefully you've also become aware that as we continue on this journey, I've not followed a particular order of examination. The only order that I've followed up to this point deals with categories. Dealing, we talked first of all with the incommunicable attributes and now we are dealing with communicable. The only reason I am bringing up holiness first is because that's what God laid on my heart. I stand amazed we had picked out this new song, King of Heaven, last year. And uh, we knew that we were going to present it. And then it dawned on me today as we're playing through it, oh, we're saying holy, holy. And we're going to talk about that today. And God has an interesting sense of humor uh, lining things up. The question can be asked, what is holiness? Well, holiness is simply the state of being holy. That's how the dictionary defines it. This puzzles me when I think about how we use terms such as holy moly, holy cow, holy smoke, holy mackerel. Now listen, I know what mackerel is. I know what a cow is. I know what smoke is. What is a moly? Yeah. (laughs) One of the greatest 20th century scholars, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, said, holiness primarily means separation. Separation from evil. It is essential, absolute purity. So throughout Scripture, holiness has to do with being distinct. It has to do with separation from evil. It has to do with being in a class all by itself. There is no rival. In other words, nothing or no one else compares with God. Dr. R.C. Sproul, one of the greatest Reformed theologians of our day, said, when the Bible calls God holy, it means primarily that God is transcendently separate. He is so far above and beyond us that he seems almost totally foreign to us. To be holy is to be other, to be different in a special way. 
This is not the first time you heard the word transcendent. We talked about transcendent, meaning uh, not being confined by any means, by anything within creation, anything within time, space, or matter. But transcendent also means beyond and outside the ordinary range of human experience or understanding. We talked about there's some things we can know about God, but we'll never know all there is to know about God because we only have a finite understanding. How do we totally understand the infinite? In addition, holiness has to do with ethical and moral purity. Purity is that state of being free from sin or moral, moral wrong. And so in regard to God, purity means that there is no possibility that God could entertain sin. He is not the author of sin. He doesn't tempt anyone else to sin. God cannot be drawn into sin. God's purity is transcendent purity. It is almost beyond and outside the ordinary range of human existence. We know nothing, nothing like it. As an overview, you could say that this attribute of holiness calls attention to all that God is. He's holy with an absolute holiness, holiness that knows no degrees. God can't possibly become more holy any more than he possibly be, can become less holy. Separation from sin has always been important to God. Always. Let me give you some examples. First of all, God commanded the people of Israel to be holy, right? And in Leviticus 14, God states, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. And so even if we look, if we look at the tabernacle, tabernacle, the tabernacle was a place that God considered holy. And the first room in the tabernacle was called the holy place. And in the tabernacle, there was a veil that was constructed that separated the holy place from the most holy place, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Within the tabernacle, the altar and Aaron and his sons were to be made holy. They were to be set apart for the service of God. If you recall, when God gave Moses the commandments, one of them was to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Keeping it holy. Because God's holiness calls attention to all God is. It's used as a synonym, an equivalent word for his deity. So because God is holy, all of God's attributes are holy. That is, whatever we think about as belonging to God must be thought of as holy. That reminds us that his love is a holy love, that his justice is a holy justice, that his mercy is a holy mercy, that his knowledge is a holy knowledge. God cannot be any other way. Holy is the way God is. Being holy, God does not conform to any standards. Why? Because he is the standard. He is absolute holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is totally incapable of being other than it is. And so each person in the Godhead possesses this holiness as well. God the Father is holy, God the Son is holy, and the Spirit is holy. What is wonderful to me, what is wonderful to me is to know that this is an attribute God wants to share with us. That's why it's a communicable attribute. Now let me explain what I mean by sharing. When I say sharing, I don't mean that God is giving away a portion of his holiness. I mean, that's how we typically think of sharing, giving someone a portion of something that we possess. No one likes chocolate, do they? So I have, I have a candy bar. And if I want to share a candy bar, part of my chocolate bar with Allie, I would take and I would open up my candy bar. Mmm. -hmm. 
and I would break off a portion of it, and I would give it to her. We're sharing, right? <laughs> if you notice from this illustration, when I'm sharing, I'm giving a portion of something that I possess to her. When I give away something that I possess to someone else, I have less of it, don't I? Man, now I don't have any of it. <laughs> this is not what I mean when I say that God shares the attribute of holiness. Because he cannot give away a part of who he is. He cannot be diminished in any way. He cannot give away a portion of who he is because God is not made up of parts. When I say share, I mean that he has created us with the capacity to be holy. With the capacity to be holy. If you stop and think about it, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them in a, in a state of innocence. I mean, they did not have, as it were, a sin nature. They were in a state of purity at the time. Creation had no understanding, no idea of what evil or what sin was because sin had not come into the world yet. You could say they were holy. Not like God is holy by any means, but they were created in the image of God. They had the capacity to be holy. Sadly, this part of our image bearing like many other aspects, was affected by sin. It was not eliminated. It simply means that we no longer possess the ability to be holy on our own apart from God's help. We are incapable of being holy on our own. If you have read the Bible from cover to cover, you would know that God still expects his people to be holy today, right? I mean, why? He expects us to be holy because he is holy. Because we are his image bearers. Does this mean then that God expects something that is impossible for us to achieve? And the answer is yes and no. Yes and no. Yes, it is impossible for us to regain the capacity to be holy again on our own ability apart from God. No, it is not impossible for with God all things are possible. The key, the key to being considered holy and the ability to live in a state of holiness hinges on our relationship to Jesus Christ. Those of us who have surrendered their lives to him, those of us who have believed and called upon his name for salvation, have his holiness credited to our account because we are in Christ Jesus. The fancy theological term for this is called imputation. The holiness of Christ is imputed to those who are his. Therefore, God looks upon us as being holy because of Jesus. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of what Christ has done. Those of us who are in Christ now have the ability to live our lives in a state of holiness. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to lead us down that path to holiness, to give us the ability to be able to live morally and ethically pure lives. Once again, we have this capacity because we have received this by impartation. Now, I don't care if you ever remember those two words. It's, it's not a big deal. What is important for you to remember is that God has made a way for us to be holy. That's what's important. 
From the Old Testament through the New Testament, God expects his people to be holy because he is holy and because we are created in his image. Granted, we'll never be holy in the same manner that God is holy, but we are commanded to be morally pure, to be ethically pure. We are expected to resist sin. If we lose sight of the truth that God is holy, our knowledge of him will always be incomplete. Our worship will become irreverent and our lives will become immoral. God tells us to be holy for a reason. And the reason is mind-blowing. He wants the very best for us. He wants the very best for us. Left to our own ways and our own ability, we can't be holy. And that's why he took the initiative for us to be holy before the world began. When we really begin to understand the holiness of God, we become more aware of the seriousness of sin. We begin to view sin as God views sin. When we really see and understand the holiness of God, we become more aware of our need for a Savior. When we really see and understand the holiness of God, we become more aware of what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross, as well as the importance of the resurrection. When we really see and understand the holiness of God, we become more aware of how great and how majestic he really is. And what really excites me is how God wants me to be just like him, even if it is in a finite way. While we're on the subject of holiness, I want to discuss another element that some feel is a separate attribute of God, uh, whether it is or it is a part of holiness is not what's really important. What is important is that we understand this, and what I'm talking about is glory. The glory of God is mentioned in many, many different places throughout Scripture. This word can be understood in a number of different ways. In one sense, it simply means uh, an expression of honor. It means of excellent reputation. That's the meaning behind Isaiah 43, 7, where God speaks about his sons and daughters. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory whom I have formed and made. Romans 3.23 carries with it the exact same idea, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In his high priestly prayer in John 17.5, Jesus prays, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Same meaning. And finally, in Hebrews 1.3, we find the last example of the meaning of, of honor or excellent reputation. In the first part of this verse, we read, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Glory describes the superlative honor that is present within the Godhead, within Father, Son, Spirit. It describes the superlative honor that should be given to God by all creation. But this is not the meaning that I want to address as far as the attribute of holiness is concerned. It's just one of the meanings. You see, there's another meaning. Grace is also the public display of the holiness of God. Let's face it, we cannot see God's holiness any more than we can see God's being, see his essence. In that you could say, well, you know, then it must be an incommunicable attribute 
of God. Well, I included it in God's communicable attributes because it is an attribute of himself that he shares with us. It is God's display of holiness within creation. And when God displays his holiness within creation, it is called glory. Glory is the public display of the holiness of God. Let me give you an Old Testament and a New Testament example. In Exodus chapter 33, we read, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. That blows me away. Can you imagine that? God speaking with you as a man speaks with his friends. And he tells Moses that he knows him by name and that he has found favor with him. Listen, when I take my last dying breath, I would like God to say to me, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. Shouldn't this be a desire that we all possess? Moses replies by asking God to teach him his ways so that he may know God better and that he would continue to find favor with him. Again, all of us who are in Christ should desire this very thing as well. And then Moses said, now show me your glory. And God replies to Moses' request. He said, and the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Notice how God equates glory with goodness. And then God continues. But he said, you, shall, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Moses cannot witness certain attributes of God because God is transcendent. It's not possible. God, uh, Moses can't see God's holiness with his own eyes, but he can see God's glory, which is what he asked God to show him in the first place, right? In the next three verses, we read this. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Moses, like any other human being, cannot witness God's holiness. But he can witness his glory because his glory is the public display of his holiness. I want you to notice what the Apostle John had to say about God's glory. In John chapter 1, verse 14, we read, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among, among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. My favorite scripture passage that combines God's holiness with his grace is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, which reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their face. With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The angelic host calls attention to who God is. God is holy, holy, holy. They also call attention to how God ex uh, displays his holiness within creation. The whole earth 
is full of his glory. Commenting on this, R.C. Sproul says, the Bible says that God is holy, holy, holy. Not that he is merely holy or even holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. The Bible never says God is love, 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 or mercy, 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 or wrath, 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 or justice, justice, justice. It does say he is holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let me make one final comment regarding holiness and glory. Just as glory is the public display of God's holiness, glory also has to do with the brightness or light that surrounds God's presence. Let me give you an example. I want you to notice what the psalmist says in Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2. The psalmist says, O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. Another example can be found in the events surrounding the birth of Christ, if you recall. Shepherds were out tending their flocks in the fields. And as they were doing so, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Never seen anything like that. The same glory appeared when Jesus took Peter and James and John with him and led them up high on a mountain. We call this the Mount of Transfiguration because of the striking change that took place in Jesus' appearance. Therefore, he was transfigured before him. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Can you begin to imagine such an unbelievable sight? Glory and light go hand in hand. I want to give you one more example that I think is pretty exciting. Near the very end of the vision that the Apostle John received while he was on the island of Patmos, he states that he saw a new heaven and a new earth. He saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And then he also described it in this way. He said... It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. And then in the next 11 verses, he goes on, and he tries to describe exactly what this is like. And then in verses 23 and 24, he states this. He said, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Finally, when Jesus returns again, we will receive glorified bodies. As 1 Corinthians 15, 43 points out, we will be raised in glory. Now, all this brings us back to the communicable attribute that we call holiness. Because we are created in God's image, we reflect his glory because of Jesus Christ. So we are to be holy as God is holy. We are to separate ourselves from evil in all its forms. We are to maintain moral and ethical purity. And we are to reflect the glory of God in our lives. I mean, that's the whole point that Jesus was making in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, look at you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds 
and praise your Father in heaven. Holiness. God is holy. We are holy. We are created in his image. Let's give thanks to God for creating us to be his image bearers. Let's give thanks that he has provided a way for us to be holy because on our own we couldn't do it. Let us strive to know him to a greater capacity. And let us purpose in our heart to let our light shine before men. Let's go before the throne of grace in prayer, keeping in mind the needs of Anna, keeping in mind Nolan and uh, Martha Dubison. Let's pray as the Spirit leads.
Isn't it great to be a child of the king? Guess what part of the theme of this last song that we'll be singing together is? Glory! Heard that someplace? Hopefully you haven't forgotten. Let's stand and give praise to God by singing glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you. Let us depart from here, living out those words that we just declared. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go live out your faith.